All right, how's everybody doing? All right, we are glad that you're here. It's going to be a good night. We are going to cover a whole bunch of books tonight. We are going to finish the Old Testament tonight. I'm saying all these things for myself, not for you. I'm encouraging myself to, uh, to do what I set out to do. And uh, if I talk very fast, we can do it. So anyway, but we are, uh, we are glad that, that you're here. And uh, when we left off last week, uh, we finished the major prophets. We ended with the book of Daniel, which takes us through the reign of the Medo-Persian Empire. And uh, the section we're going to cover tonight to close out uh, the, what, we, what we call the Old Testament, what is probably more accurately called the Hebrew Scriptures, um, is a section that's called the Minor Prophets. Now, they are not called Minor um, Prophets because they are less important, or the Major Prophets because they're more important. They are called Minor Prophets because the books are shorter than, the, uh, than Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and, uh, and Daniel. So um, these books are kind of sprinkled throughout Israel's history. Um, and, and we're going to talk about it, how some of the books happen before the Babylonian exile. And then a couple of them, uh, three of them are after the Babylonian exile when the people go back into the land. So let's uh, jump in and get started uh, with an amazing book called Hosea. Uh, Hosea, if you're taking notes, is about the faithfulness of God. Uh, Hosea was a prophet to the southern kingdom from 760 to 720 BC. And uh, if you'll note in, in your notes in Hosea chapter 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Now, don't be confused. If you were with us on uh, a couple Sundays ago, we did a whole message on Jeroboam. This is not the same Jeroboam. This is a Jeroboam that's happening much later. He just happens to be named after that loser uh, that was the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel. So it's, they're two different people. Typically, they're referred to as Jeroboam, and then this guy would be considered Jeroboam II or Jeroboam II. Um, the name Hosea uh, means salvation. Uh, it comes from the Hebrew root word, Hoshea, uh, which, are, by the way, uh, jo the name Joshua or Jehoshua, um, as you would say it in Hebrew, um, is uh, the name for salvation. The name Jesus is the Greek version of the name Jehoshua. Um, so anyway, uh, Hosea's message is one of apostasy, uh, people falling away from the faith um, of the northern kingdom. And so, and he's telling them that judgment is coming, which would eventually happen uh, in 722 uh, BC. And we talked about that, the uh, Assyrians coming. And if you're with us on Sunday when we talked about Jeroboam, we talked about one of the reasons that the Assyrians came was because of the sins of Jeroboam. And so, which was idolatry, which was setting up these uh, false god idol worship centers, uh, one in Dan and then one further to the south. And so, anyway, this period from Jeroboam the second to um, Hoshea, not to not to be confused, Hosea. Hoshea was the last king of the northern kingdom. Every king was assassinated by his successor. So this is a horrible situation. There were essentially nine different dynasties. There was one dynasty in the south, the family of David, um, that, that goes you know, all the way from uh, David all, all the way you know, to the end, to the captivity. Um, the, the northern kingdom had nine different dynasties, most of which ended through murder and assassination. So a horrible situation up there. Uh, Ho Hosea is to the northern kingdom what Jeremiah was to the southern kingdom. Um, Jeremiah, if you remember, was the weeping prophet. Um, he was hurt by the things that were happening, people falling away from the faith. But um, to illustrate how bad things are in the north, God commands Hosea uh, to do something shocking. Uh, God commands him to marry a prostitute. Um, in fact, let me read it to you. This is Hosea chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. It says, The word of the Lord came to Hosea, 
um, the son of Beri in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahab, uh, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, uh, the king of Israel. We read that before. It says, uh, when the, the Lord began to speak to Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So uh, he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Deblame. She's got some Deblame. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and she conceived and bore him a son. Now, listen, I, I don't know this for a fact. I'm under the impression she wasn't much of a looker um, because once again, I just can't imagine a very attractive girl being named Gomer. Uh, that's just me, you know. But um, God tells Hosea uh, to love this woman because it's a picture of his relationship with the nation of Israel, uh, with the northern kingdom, that he loves them and that they just continually leave him uh, for someone else to serve other gods. And at one point in the book, um, you know, he, he's, you know, Hosea is seeking to hey, we're, we're married, we're, we're having a family, there's a couple of children that are born, and he's trying to love his wife, and she leaves for another lover. And um, in, in, in chapter three of Hosea, this is how the story begins to move. It says, then the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved uh, by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, um, who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans, uh, that was food that pagans ate as part of their rituals. Uh, and so I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half uh, homers of barley. And I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be toward you. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim, Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Now, this is a picture that God is never going to forsake his people. There may be discipline and consequences, but God is not going to forsake his people. Now, Hosea's, Hosea chapter 4 through 7 spells out the sins of the nation. From Hosea chapter 8 through 14, it concludes with how the nation is going to be punished. Um, Assyria will be the instrument that God uses to ultimately uh, punish the nation and, and sweep them away into captivity. Um, but you know, Hosea chapter 4 verse 1 gives us what the root of the problem is. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, uh, for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. You see, the people had set up their own places of worship. They had rejected the prophets who were proclaiming the word of God. And this is how, listen, it works in your life and in my life, in our lives collectively. We get out of fellowship collectively with believers. And it's not going to be that much longer until we begin to reject God's word as well. And it leads us down a path of uh, sin and messing up our lives completely. And that, what happens to the nation um, as a whole is the very same thing that can happen to us as individuals. And there's another thing before we move on that I want to share that I think is really important. Um, um, Hosea teaches us something in, in this book, and that love is a choice. Um, God told Hosea to love Gomer, and he did. And she, she did all these things, and, and he still made a choice uh, to, to love her. And, and, and the issue is this, is that a lot of times we've bought into... Um, cultural definitions of love, that it's this euphoric feeling. Love is not a euphoric feeling. Love is a choice that you make. In fact, I, I would venture to say the longer that you love someone, the less euphoric it feels. Because, listen, and this is, an, I think, an important thing, um, the less you, love feels less euphoric the, the longer that you love someone because many times we don't sense the things that are the most consistent in our lives. The longer something is in our life, the less um, that it, it, feels, it feels new. This is true with God's presence. Um, when you're a young Christian, there, there is this, 
overwhelming sense of God's presence in your life. You come into worship and you start weeping and you don't even know why you're crying. You're not someone who cries, but um, God is doing something in your life and you feel it. And then that feeling starts to go away. And, and you're wondering to yourself, like, well, why am I, fe- why is that? How come I don't have that feeling I used to have? And what will happen is, and I see Christians do this so often, they kind of go from church to church, from experience to experience, chasing after this feeling that they had when, when, it was, when it was brand new. And the problem is, it's not that God's presence is gone. It's not that the worship leader isn't good. It's not that the church is not walking in the spirit. It's that you've become accustomed to God's work in your life. And the things that we are, um, the, the things that are most consistent in our lives are the things that we, we don't feel as much anymore. And that's just, that's how it is. That's how it is with love. That's how it is with, um, many times with, 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 with God's presence. And Hosea teaches us that. All right, let's move on to Joel. Uh, Joel, the book of Joel is about, the theme is the day of God. Uh, Joel, the book of Joel is great because it only has one point. It's three chapters. He has one point. God is coming. And uh, that's the key phrase in the book of Joel is the day of the Lord. He was preaching to the southern kingdom uh, of Judah, and he makes no mention of the northern kingdom. And so uh, scholars sometimes wonder where to place the book of Joel because we don't get a lot of um, internal markers as to where he falls. He doesn't tell us, like Hosea, hey, I was serving around this time or that time or serving around this king. Uh, but the, the, the thing that we see is there's no mention of the northern kingdom, uh, which means they've probably already been swept away into captivity. So most scholars put Joel uh, somewhere around 609 B.C., to 586 BC. 586 uh, BC was when the Babylonians came in and destroyed the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, destroyed the walls, destroyed everything. Um, The book of Joel is very picturesque. He uses a lot of images. He uses the images of vapor, smoke, fire, locusts coming in and destroying everything. In fact, just to give you a little taste of it, this is Joel chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. He says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. For it is at hand a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds that spread over the mountains. A people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be such after them, even for many successive generations. Uh, the, what he's referring to here is um, the tribulation, uh, ultimately the return of Jesus. Uh, and there's uh, things that are mentioned in here that hearken to the book of Revelation, which we'll cover in a couple of weeks. Um, so the, the phrase, the day of the Lord, is used um, over 20 times uh, in the Old Testament to describe one period of time the events leading up to the second coming of Jesus. Now, obviously, when I say the day of the Lord, it's not like one specific day. There are events. It's a period of time leading up to a specific day, uh, which is uh, the coming of the Lord. And you'll see that in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. If It's not in your nose. You just jot that somewhere. Um, That he says that I was taken in the Spirit on the day of the Lord. And uh, he begins to see all of these things. And this, once again, we've talked about this over the last couple of weeks, that there is this whole idea of near and far prophecy. There's the near fulfillment, but then there's things that are mentioned in there like, he's not talking about right now, he's talking about something in the future. And so what happens is, is that he's talking about the Babylonians coming in and destroying the city of Jerusalem, but then there's other things that he's talking about um, because he's saying, hey, this is an army that you're never gonna see again. Well, once again, we've seen greater armies than the Babylonians. Uh, So he's not talking about the Babylonians, he's talking about something further out, which is gonna be uh, towards the end of history. Um, When the Holy Spirit was poured out uh, in the book of Acts chapter two, and people began to speak with new tongues and worshiping God, um, and the people looked on, and uh, you know, if you remember the story, they looked on and they said, oh look, these people are drunk. And then Peter stands up and he says, listen, these people aren't drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. He's like, listen, even the drunks aren't drunk by 9 a.m. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. 
And this is what uh, he quotes from Joel chapter 2. Uh, it's in your notes. It says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the earth, uh, the heavens and in the earth, fire and blood and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And uh, I, I do love that one of the things that, now that's speaking of once again, um, what God's gonna do leading up to the return of Jesus. But one of the things, if you read the book of Joel, is that Joel will talk about the gloom and doom. And nobody does gloom and doom better than Joel. Um, in the Old Testament. I mean, he is, this is like his wheelhouse is doing gloom and doom. However, he does gloom and doom, and then he talks about the, um, he gives this hope at the end. And so he talks the gloom and doom, and then he says, but you know, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so he says, he does the gloom and doom uh, in, in chapter two, and then he says, but I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. And uh, so it's really, it's a wonderful book uh, talking about the day of the Lord, the time of tribulation, the season at the end of history uh, when Jesus is going to return. All right, let's move on to the book of Amos. Um, he's famous. We'll talk about him for a little bit. Um, sorry, that's a terrible joke. Uh, all right, uh, Amos is about the correction of God. Uh, Amos's ministry takes place during the reign of Jeroboam II. Um, this makes him a contemporary of Hosea, of Jonah, and of Isaiah. Um, we, it starts, and this is a pretty cool thing in the very beginning of, of Amos. It tells us a little bit about himself. He says this, uh, the words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning uh, Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Um, it, was, uh, it seems from what we can tell that Amos did not have any theological training. Now, you've got to understand, in the book of 2 Kings, one of the things that you'll read about is that there was what was called a school of the prophets. And uh, Elisha goes and, and is you know, helping them. These are guys that feel called of God. And, um, but he, he, this, you know, he's not part of that. Um, Amos was a simple man. He was essentially um, a, a farmer uh, who had a unique call to ministry. And listen, the, the cool thing is this, is that if you want to be someone who is used of God greatly, theological training is excellent. And it's, it's important. Getting theology degree is great. But the thing that you need more than a, a great theological training is the call of God on your life. That's the thing that you need more than anything is the call of God as he reveals um, himself to you and tells you exactly what he wants you um, to do. And that's the thing that Amos had. He maybe didn't have the theological education, but what he had was the most important thing, which was the call of God. Um, the book divides itself um, pretty neatly. Uh, it, it's chapters one and two are eight judgments uh, that God gives. And then he preaches three sermons in chapters three through six. And then there's uh, five visions that are recorded in, in verses seven through nine, or chapter seven through nine. Uh, I love this passage in Amos chapter three, verse seven. It says, surely the Lord God does nothing until he reveals his secret to his servant, the prophets. And I, I love what Amos says there, that God doesn't do anything without having his servants, the prophets, declare it. And what that means for us is that um, it allows us to trust God's word as the source of what does God want me to do? that whatever it is that, God, that we feel God leading us to do, um, we can find it in the Bible, and that it's never going to contradict the Bible. And, uh, and that's always a good thing, because listen, when people, when churches, and when movements get weird, and there are times that people get weird. You know any weird people? Like Christians that just start going off to like La La Land? right? That's, there's, like, there are churches that go off. There's whole entire movements of churches that go weird. It always starts with some new vision. It always starts with some new revelation, and it always leads people away from the Word of God. I'm telling you, I've been watching this 
for more than 20 years, and every time there's some new crazy thing, um, it's, it, it starts with uh, some, this, oh, no, but see, I had a special vision, okay? And, and, but then, yeah, I know what the Bible says, but, but I got this other addendum. Like once people start talking addendum, I'm out, right? That's, you know, that's, that's it. Um, now, but here's the thing is that, and, and listen, over the last 17 years, what we've been trying to do at Calvary is not lead people away from God. We've been trying to get people closer to the Bible, start reading the Bible, have God speak to you from the Bible, because that is the safest place that you can be when God is speaking to you through the word of God. All right, let's move on to the book of Obadiah. Uh, Obadiah is about the retribution of God. Um, Obadiah is a one-chapter book. It is the shortest book in the Old Testament. It really is more of a postcard uh, than, than a book, but it's not the kind of postcard you want to get. It's not like having a great time here and, you know, it's not, not that good. Um, it's a prophecy against uh, the nation of Edom. Uh, so let me show you up here on the map, the nation of Edom, the Edomites. And um, so this is the northern kingdom of Israel. This is the southern kingdom of Judah. This is um, the Philistines. Are you kind of familiar with them? And then um, this is uh, it's this Aram, which is sometimes, tra- it's, it's Syria, but sometimes translated Aram. Uh, these are the Ammonites, Moabites. Um, so if you remember the story of Ruth, uh, they go to Moab. Anyway, these are the Edomites with their capital city of Petra. Now, uh, the name Obadiah means the servant of Yahweh. And uh, there are 13 people in the Bible who are named Obadiah. So this is apparently back then, this is a very popular name. Um, But Obadiah's message was not popular because he had to tell a nation, the country of Edom, who were Israel's neighbors, that that judgment was coming to them. It was written um, shortly after the destruction of Jerusalem. So this is, you know, right after the people have gone into exile. And um, Edom, from what, as we read, they were watching the people of Judah go into exile, and in their pride, they were saying, yeah, look what happened. That would never happen to us. And I'm gonna tell you why in just a moment, but this is what it says at the beginning of Obadiah uh, in verses two to four. It says this. It says, behold, I will make you small among the nations, and you shall be greatly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who dwell in the cleft of the rock, whose habitation is high, uh, you who say in your heart, Uh, Who will bring me down to the ground, though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. Now, why was Edom so proud? Their capital city was Petra, which was considered to be impregnable. Um, What's odd about Petra is that um, people doubted that Petra or the Edomite, you know, they, they doubted that they even existed uh, until 1812 when a guy by the name of uh, Johann Burkhardt, uh, a Swiss explorer, found the city. Now, um, he was a guy who believed the Bible and um, he, was, he lived among the people of Jordan. And um, they, uh, when they said um, that he, there was gonna be a sacrifice made, they took him to Petra. Now, I've been to Petra, it is absolutely stunning. Uh, now, let me show you a couple pictures here of the city of Petra. I've walked down this. This is in, the, this is in Jordan now. So you have to walk through this, uh, and it's a little bit of a ways. And then if we see the next picture, um, you'll see this. Now, those of you that saw um, Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade, um, if I remember correctly, and forgive me, I, I may have my Indiana Jones. Um, I believe that in the movie they said that this was Alexandria in Egypt, if I remember correctly. If, if I'm wrong, someone will help me out. Um, but um, this is Petra. Now, I have a picture of myself, and maybe I'll bring it sometime, standing right here. What you can't see um, right here where the steps are is that there is, um, in this rock, there's almost like an, like an indentation. And the reason that there's an indentation is because this is where they would do all their sacrifices and then that's where kind of the blood would pool and then it would, it would flow out 
from there. So they would have that there, and then you see another set of steps that they go, they go in there, and we were able to kind of walk around this. This goes on. The city of Petra, um, if you kind of come out here and then, you know, hang a right, it opens up, um, and there's all of these caves, um, and it goes on for several miles. Um, if I remember correctly, um, I was wise enough only to walk about a mile because I realized if you walk a mile out, you're going to have to walk back. Um, Pastor John uh, was with me, and he did not have that same wise sense that I had, and he walked like four or five miles out. And then, you know, like an hour later, he's like, oh, snap, I got to walk back. And we were all getting on the bus, and he's like, you know, dun, 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 dun. he's running as fast as he can trying to get back. I'll let him tell you that story. Um, anyway, good stuff. The thing about Petra, now this opening, if we can go back to the picture before, um, this is only about 40 feet, this, this, uh, this, this opening at its smallest. Um, the, the, so at its max, it's 40 feet, kind of at the mouth of it. And at its smallest opening, it's about 12 feet. Um, so, you know, when we walked in and we were a group of, I think, 65 people when we went, um, or 70 people, something like that. My wife and I uh, were there and, and we were walking in. I mean, you couldn't be more than four people deep, you know, three, four people wide um, at its, you know, as, because it fluctuated so much. Now, this is why they, it said it only took, that entire city only took 20 men to guard the entire city because they would hide in the rocks and hurl down boulders to anyone who was invading. And this is why the Edomites were so proud. They thought that they could, what happened to Judah uh, could never happen to them. And uh, the problem is, Eventually it did. Um, you know, Edom, uh, the Edomites hated the people of Judah because um, Edom, if you're not aware, um, the Edomites were descendants of Esau. Now, if you're, uh, you know this, Abraham um, had a son named Isaac who was the child of promise. And then um, he had a handmaiden named Hagar. Um, and there's a whole line that goes through there. Um, Isaac... Um, has twins that, that, are, that are born, um, and then there's their, their twins. One uh, comes out first, whose name is Esau, and he's red and hairy, and, and the name Esau means red and hairy. Um, so anyway, so uh, he comes out, and then his younger brother Jacob uh, comes out. And so um, if you read Genesis 27, you'll begin to see um, or really kind of starting at the end of chapter 26, you'll begin to see all of the, um, you know, the animosity that happens and the rivalry between the two brothers. Eventually, Jacob steals the blessing, the, the, the birthright and the blessing from Esau, his brother, um, that, that Isaac was supposed to give him. And then he leaves, and, and the Bible has this really interesting phrase. It says that Esau comforted himself with the thought of killing his brother. Like, that's only like, you know, getting upset. It's like, okay, just calm down. You're going to kill him. Like, okay, I feel a lot better now. So, and um, anyway, uh, they made peace later on. Um, and you can read about that, chapters 32, 33 of, um, of the book of Genesis. But there's still tension now between the descendants of Jacob and the descendants of Esau, uh, who are the descendants of Esau, the Edomites, descendants of Jacob, um, Israel. And so, so much so that now let's fast forward from Genesis um, uh, through the, the rest of the uh, Torah, um, Exodus, Numbers, uh, um, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, when the ch children of Israel were on their way uh, from Egypt and on their way to the promised land in Numbers chapter 20, um, they asked, if we can go back to the map, they asked them as they're coming out, hey, can we cut through your land so that we can get to the land of, uh, of promise that you have for us as they were coming out of Egypt, which is uh, the Sinai Peninsula is somewhere down here by the drum set. Um, so anyway, uh, they said no. The Edomites said no. And um, think about this. The verses that we read before, it shows them laughing, mocking, gloating, boasting, and then stealing from Israel um, while they're, they're being invaded. Um, and listen, now what happens is, is that um, if you read Obadiah eight times, he says, on the day, on the day, on the day, on the day. And he recounts, God recounts the charges against Edom. And uh, eventually, um, God allowed 
you know, Babylon to, to uh, conquer them. And um, instead of, once again, them, them helping Israel, they took advantage of Israel in their, their worst moment. Their temple had been destroyed, the walls had been destroyed, and they just came in to um, invade. There's this passage in, in Obadiah where he says, you should not have stood at the crossroads. Um, now, let me show you what I mean by the crossroads. This is the main road that connected. Um, do we have that? Okay. This is um, uh, what is called, this is called the King's Highway uh, right through here. I, I had, when we uh, went to Israel, we stayed in a city called Elat, which is right around here, um, right on the Dead Sea. Uh, I'm sorry, right on the Red Sea. And so it was pretty cool. Um, and uh, we were able to... Um, I don't know, I do these things, but I was there, and we're on the Red Sea, so I ran out, stuck my hand in the Red Sea. Um, it didn't part from me or anything. I just wanted to say I touched the Red Sea because I'm weird about things. And then we crossed over into Jordan, and then we drove up to, um, to Petra, and then we spent the day in Petra, then we drove up, and then uh, we crossed over uh, a little further up. At, uh, we crossed back over into Jericho, um, just like the children of Israel. Um, but anyway, this is the King's Highway. This is the area, this King's Highway connected um, Africa. Um, as they, people would come up from Africa, they would go through the King's Highway. And then north of Jericho, there would be an area for them to literally um, go west if they wanted to go to Europe. Um, or they could go um, east if they wanted to go to the Far East or, uh, you know, the Orient or Asia. And... Um, and so the children of Israel took that road out of Egypt in 1450 BC. And, um, and what happens is, is that uh, once you're on the King's Highway, I mean, you can go anywhere. The, the, the issue is, if the people made it to the King's Highway, you know, they, 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 they had escaped, they could have been free, right? So this gets destroyed, they go out to the King's Highway, and um, if Edom hadn't stopped them, because... These guys were, they stood at the crossroads and cut off anyone who had escaped from the, the Babylonian uh, siege. In fact, in verses 17 and 18, it says, But on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance, there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, but the house of Esau shall be stubble. And uh, they shall kindle them and devour them, and no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Um, he's saying two things at the end. He's saying, listen, Israel's going to be back, and they're actually going to take more land than they had before. And here's the other thing. You will be gone. Because there's this principle throughout the entire Bible that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace uh, to the humble. All right. Uh, let's go to uh, the book of Jonah. Uh, the book of Jonah, the theme of the book of Jonah is the love of God. Uh, Jonah is obviously the most famous of the minor prophets because we all know his story. We've all seen the VeggieTales movie. Um, so, um, you know, God calls Jonah to, the city, to a city called Nineveh, which is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Um, upon hearing that, uh, Jonah grabs a ship going in the opposite direction to Tarshish, which most people believe to be um, uh, Great Britain. Some people believe it's, you know, Spain, Portugal, which it's possible, but some say it's, it's all the way out to even Great Britain. Um, uh, he gets thrown overboard and uh, gets swallowed up by this great fish and then gets spit up on the shores of Nineveh. Uh, or the, uh, the, shore, the shores of, of Nineveh there in Assyria. And this is where the story gets interesting. And once again, we've all, we all know the story for the most part. So I want to kind of talk a little bit more about uh, this from like a, maybe a graduate level uh, and not the Sunday school level that we kind of hear it from. Uh, Jonah gets barfed out um, on this. He's got, you know, probably the gastric juices of this fish all over him, which has probably bleached him completely, uh, you know, He's probably been bleached completely white. Um, he's probably got no, uh, because of that, no hair on his head, no beard, no eyebrows. I mean, it's just, I mean, this just clean off. Um, and so, um, the, <laughs> I, I shouldn't say that. Okay, this is another thing I was going to say, but I'm not going to say that because it's good. It's good. It's working. The little stop, don't say that it's working. God's working in my life. Uh, so anyway, uh, 
But then Jonah gives literally like the, I'm a preacher and I, I, when I listen to communicators, I don't listen to them and many, I kind of listen at them because um, I'm, you know, you know how it is, you know, whatever you do when you see somebody else do it, you're, you're not just listening or watching, you're kind of evaluating. Um, and so, but he gives a terrible sermon. This is literally the wor- most half-hearted message. I mean, this guy shows up finally and he says, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Peace out. That's it. You got to set it up. Tell them a story. It's just out on the open seas just the other day. You know, I mean, he could have started with anything, but amazingly, everyone repents. Now, what causes the Ninevites to hear that message and repent? The reality is that it's a lot more than just that message. There's a lot of things going on that are important for us to note. There were two plagues that hit that area um, in around that same time that wiped out thousands of people. There was a total solar eclipse that had gone on at that time, which was a very bad omen in that culture. And on top of that, um, these tribes to the north of Assyria had started to band together and they were um, gaining steam towards uh, the area of Nineveh. In less than 100 years, Uh, those tribes will become the Babylonian empire that will wipe out the Assyrians completely. And then lastly, and I think maybe this is most importantly, the Assyrians worshiped a god whose name was Dagon, uh, who was the fish god. And so when the story comes out of this guy who's vomited out of a fish and he starts preaching that they need to repent, the people freak out and they believe that. That's a big deal to them. And the people repent, everybody repents, everybody's wearing sackcloth. Um, As if you were with us on Sunday, you know that sackcloth is a a garment that's made of goat's hair, but they turn it inside out so that it's irritating and causing rash and all this kind of stuff. Well, the Bible says that they even put it on the animals. Like even, I guess the animals had to repent too. Who knows what they were doing? But uh, they're like, let's just cover all the bases. We don't know what those people were doing. Um, So anyway... But that all happens, and, and it goes to chapter 4 of Jonah, and I, and I put this on here. Uh, it says this, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, oh, Lord, this is not what I said. Was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled, I fled uh, previously to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, the one who relents from doing harm. Now, therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. The people of Nineveh heard the message of Jonah and they believed God. They did what God said. I mean, this is what, just a little inside baseball. This makes preachers very happy. Uh, when people take what God is saying, what they've preached and prepared, and, and people do it. It's like, okay, that's great. But Jonah has the opposite response. Everyone listened, and that made him extremely angry. Um, and by the way, it's not just like, man, you know. It, it, the, the, the word for displeased is the Hebrew word yara, Y-A-R-A, which means he is so angry that he's actually trembling. That's what this word means. Um, and it says that it, it displeased him. He's trembling. He's so mad that he became angry. And that, that word for angry is the, uh, it, it's a derivative of that. It's chara, um, which means to, to burn or to set ablaze. Jonah is not annoyed. He is in an absolute rage of what's happening here. He is beside himself that these people, um, that God would still offer them uh, the opportunity to be saved, to be forgiven, instead of just destroying them. You have to understand the story of Jonah is about a guy who is a prophet of God, but is so absolutely prejudiced against these people. He hates them. He hates them because he's seeing what's happening to the northern kingdom. He sees how evil they are. He sees that the Assyrians, the Assyrians were so brutal that when they took a city, they would stack the skulls of the people that they murdered into a pyramid when you walked into the city. That's why when the, the Assyrians were sieging a city, many times the entire city would create, ma- would, 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 um, there would be mass suicides in, um, in, in, in the city because they did not want to experience the brutality of the Assyrians. And Jonah's issue is, it's like, these people don't, don't deserve to live. How could you possibly forgive them? They're so evil. You need to judge them. 
And so, and he believes that it's like you're, you're allowing this to happen to your people. And you're letting these people be forgiven. No, that, and it just doesn't sit right. This happens to another prophet that we're going to look at shortly. The problem is, is that, listen, God's judgment is coming. Within 70 years, the Assyrians um, would, would wipe out the northern kingdom. But listen, they would ultimately get wiped out as well, the, 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 the Assyrians. Um, and, and it was by the uh, Babylonians. And so, because, and, and you know the thing about Jonah um, if you're like me, I like closed loops. Like, I like to know the thing started. Like, you ever, you ever, here's what I mean by closed loops. You, te- you, you know, you're, you're texting with someone and then you're making plans or you're making a decision about something and then you send a text and then they don't respond. Like, I want to reach through the phone and punch people in the face. Like, <laughs> close the loop with me. I'm not going to sleep. Until we close this loop. So, huh? This is how I feel. How do you feel about it? Seen. Like, oh, Jesus, take the wheel. This is not going to end well. And so, but here's the problem with the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah, God says, how can I destroy Nineveh? There's 120,000 children in that city. He says, people who don't, do not even know the right from the left. It's a very poetic way of saying there's these young kids that are, that, are in, that are in Nineveh. And how can I just wipe out that entire city? And then the book just ends. And we don't know Jonah's response. All we know is this, is that Jonah didn't get it. And the book ends and Jonah still doesn't get it. So we move on to the book of Micah, which closes the loop, thankfully. Uh, Micah's about the warnings of God. Micah's ministry uh, was to the southern kingdom of Judah uh, around the time that the northern kingdom was falling, uh, around 722 BC. Uh, Micah's main message to the people is that the southern kingdom will fall as well. He's saying to them, oh, well, you know, those guys are really bad and that's why it's falling. And he's like, listen, you're not too far behind doing some of the same things. And so there's a couple of verses that are very famous in the book of Micah. Chapter 5, verse 2, uh, that says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, uh, even uh, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth the one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. You know, this verse, we see it around Christmas time. It's the verse that tells us the birthplace of the Messiah. Um, and, that, and, and we celebrate it at Christmas because this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. The other, the other personal favorite of mine is in chapter 6 of Micah where um, he's struggling. Micah is struggling with what does God want from me? And he's like, should I do this? Should I do this? Uh, do you want me to sacrifice? I mean, do you want me, I mean, do you want me to you know, give my body to be burned? I mean, what do you want me to do? Uh, and, and he's struggling in chapter 6, and then uh, this, is, this is God's response. That he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Um, another way to say it is that God wants you to do the right thing in the right way for the right reason. Next is the book of Nahum. Uh, Nahum's theme is about the justice of God. Uh, Nahum's ministry was to the southern kingdom. He's ministering around the same time as Isaiah and Hosea. And his three chapters are all about one subject, all about the destruction of the Assyrians. That would have been like, that's what Jonah wanted. That's the job he wanted. Um, But this is Nahum talks about um, the destruction of the Assyrians. And and this is a very picturesque picture. passage in chapter three of his book. He says this, uh, behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face and I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will cast abominable filth on you, make you vile and make you a spectacle. And it will come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste and who will bemoan her and where shall I seek comforters for you? That's the whole theme, is the destruction of Assyria, which eventually happens at the hands of the Babylonians, which leads us to um, the topic of the Babylonians, which is the book of Habakkuk. 
Habakkuk it talk, it is about um, the ways of God. That's really the theme. Habakkuk is hands down, far and away, my favorite, um, my favorite uh, minor prophet for sure. Like, there's, you know, I absolutely love this book. Um, you know, there's sometimes I don't know what to read, and Habakkuk um, is one of the places that I go. Um, I love the story because Habakkuk lives where we live. Habakkuk is wrestling, and that's pretty much what he does in the whole book, is just wrestle with what's happening in his life, what's happening in the lives of the people around him. He's a guy who's wrestling with God's will as God is revealing to him what he's going to do. He's praying and saying, God, the people of Judah are evil, and you need to judge them. You need to do something that snaps them back to cause them to, to repent and come back to you. In fact, it says this in, in Habakkuk chapter 1. It says, The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. He's, these people are violent. They're doing all this. You need to do something. This is Habakkuk's prayer. When are you going to do something about it? Here's God's response in verse 5 of chapter 1. He says, Look at, among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told to you. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, or the Babylonians. Chaldea was an area in the province of Babylon. Um, I am raising up the, ba uh, the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and more fierce even than wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar and they fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. Essentially, God says, you're right, Habakkuk. We, I am gonna do something. I'm actually bringing the Babylonians to come and judge Judah. Um, this is the moment where Habakkuk starts freaking out. And, um, and, and this, is what, this is verse 12, same chapter. He says, are you not from everlasting? Like, am I talking to God here? Did I call the wrong number? This is essentially, you know, he says, O Lord God, my Holy One, we shall not die, O Lord. You have appointed them for judgment. O Rock, you have marked them for correction. He, he's saying, God, I think you misunderstood. I think I misunderstood what you're saying. I thought I heard you say that you're going to use the Babylonians to judge Judah, and that's impossible because these people are like 100 times worse than us. So what I think you said is that you're going to actually judge the Babylonians since so you still haven't answered my question. And he's like, no, I'm going to judge Judah with the Babylonians. This is going to be my instrument that I use. And this is when the wrestle begins. And he wrestles and wrestles and wrestles and wrestles for three chapters until the very end of chapter three, the end of his book. Listen, you know, there's nothing wrong with wrestling with God. There's nothing wrong with not understanding what God is doing in your life. There's nothing wrong with saying, God, how could this have possibly happened? Nothing wrong with any of those things. My, my, my challenge to you is you just can't live there. You can't spend your whole life there. At some point, we're going to have to trust. And at some point, even though we're not given all of the answers as to why, we've got to realize that God is doing something. And at the end of the book, there's this song that Habakkuk sings. It's, this is one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. He says this, he says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like deer's feet and he will make me walk on high hills to the chief musicians with the stringed instruments. Habakkuk is able to turn his wrestling into a hymn and be able to worship even without understanding everything. It's a beautiful book. If you've never read Habakkuk, read it tonight. It's really wonderful. Um, all right, let's talk about Zephaniah. Uh, Zephaniah is uh, about the discipline of God. That's the theme. Uh, Zephaniah opens differently than all the other minor prophets because he writes out his genealogy. He tells us what family he's from and 
um, it says this. It says, The word of the Lord which came uh, uh, to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, um, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah. And this sets Zephaniah apart from the other prophets because he tells us not only his time, but also uh, his lineage. Um, and that makes Zephaniah an unusual prophet because most of the prophets did not come from a royal lineage. He did. He was a descendant of the godly king uh, Hezekiah. Now the name Zephaniah means uh, Yahweh hides or can also be translated Yahweh has hidden. And uh, Zephaniah was born during the long reign of the son of Hezekiah uh, whose name was Manasseh. Manasseh in the southern kingdom was the absolute worst. Uh, that uh, the southern kingdom experienced. And, um, so, and he reigned longer. Uh, he reigned for 55 years, uh, longer than any other king in Judah. And Zephaniah was probably hidden, uh, which is why he got that name. He was hidden during that time. Uh, Zephaniah is a prophet to the southern kingdom um, who writes to them about the impending judgment that's coming. And, and um, the 12 minor prophets are divided into two groups. And I mentioned it earlier, but just to uh, remind you, there's the, what are called the pre-exilic or before the exile to Babylon and then the post-exilic. The first nine um, are pre-exilic. That is before the uh, Babylonians uh, destroyed Jerusalem and conquered Judah, um, and th of which this is the last. This is the ninth. Um, the last three, um, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, um, are what are called post-exilic, and that is that they were writing after the Israel returned after the 70 year uh, captivity uh, in Babylon, which later turned into uh, the Medo-Persian Empire. So, Zephaniah is the last of these, um, you know, pre-exile prophets, and, and, and what they say is that, what scholars say is, in many ways, uh, Zephaniah is kind of a summary of what God has been saying through these other eight books. And so, um, he tells them that destruction is coming, but also gives them the promise that God is again going uh, to delight in them. And this is my favorite passage from Zephaniah chapter 3. It says, In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands be weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. The Mighty One will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. And He will rejoice over you with singing. Beautiful passage. All right, let's go to the book of Haggai. The book of Haggai, it talks about the priority of God. Um, Haggai is the first of the post-Babylonian exile prophets. He's writing after the people had returned to Jerusalem. They went back to rebuild the temple. But instead of rebuilding the temple, they got caught up in rebuilding their own homes. And now years have gone by, and they still, they, they've just totally, they've gotten kind of caught up in their own drama, and they've forgotten the mission and the calling that they had. And so in chapter 1, it lays it out, Haggai lays it out. He says, thus speaks the Lord of hosts. This people says, oh, the time has not come yet, the, to the, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled homes um, and this temple lie in ruins? Now thus, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And that is the, the, kind of the key phrase in the, book of, uh, in the book of Haggai is consider your ways. And that's the message of Haggai. In two little two-chapter book, the whole message is that we need to put God first uh, in everything. All right, now, uh, an, another one of my favorites in, um, in the Minor Prophets is the book of Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah, the theme is the revelation of God. In fact, the book of Zechariah is called the revelation of the Old Testament. Um, and comparing it to the, the book of Revelation, because it deals so much with the second coming of Jesus. Um, the Zechariah's ministry was around the same time as Haggai, around you know 520 uh, BC or so. Um, the early chapters uh, deal with um, the, uh, seven visions that Zechariah gets about the t that's uh, are about uh, the, around the area of the temple and issues surrounding the temple. The latter chapel, uh, chapters of the book deal with our redemption and the return of Jesus. In fact, uh, chapters 12, 13, and 14 are particularly important to us because of the repetitive phrase, in that day. 
And every time he says in that day, he is speaking about the day of the Lord's return, the kingdom age, the millennial reign of Jesus on the earth. I'll give you a couple of my favorite passages, and I want to drill on these a little bit. It's a conversation that happens after Jesus' return. And it's a conversation between the people of Israel and the Messiah when they come to the realization that Jesus is the Messiah. And this is, this is chapter 13, verse 6. Um, if someone asks, what are these wounds on your body? They will answer, these are the wounds that I was given in the house of my friends. Um, the word for body is the Hebrew word yad, um, L-A-W-D, which is usually translated arms or literally hands. I mean, they're going to look and say, what are these wounds on your hands? And he's going to say, these are the wounds that I received in the house of my friends. Um, here's another that impacts our world today. And this is in Zechariah chapter 12. He says this, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall uh, be in the siege both against, Jerusalem, against Judah and Jerusalem. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a cup of, uh, a bur I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all the people. All that burden themselves shall be cut in pieces, though uh, a people of the earth be gathered together against it. I want you to, if you have that, underline that, that I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. This is uh, one of the, you gotta understand, the, the book of Zechariah was written 2,500 years ago. And he says that in the last days, that Jerusalem would be the ultimate hot potato that no one would be able to handle. And I want you to understand that our president campaigned on the fact that he was going to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem has recently come out and said, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Uh, George W. Bush said the same thing several years ago. Bill Clinton before him said the same thing, that as a sign of solidarity with the Jewish people, we're gonna, that, it, that the capital city of Israel is Jerusalem, and we're going to move the, the, the embassy to, uh, to Jerusalem. Everybody says they're going to do it, and nobody does it because Jerusalem is a cup of trembling and it doesn't even make sense. Jerusalem is not a strategic location. Jerusalem has no natural resources. And yet, what we read is that it is not just a cup of, of trembling, not just for the Middle Eastern nations. It's a cup of trembling to all nations. Because this is what happens. What happens in Israel affects the entire world. Um, and ultimately, um, and as, you see in the, as we see in the book of Zechariah, that Israel ultimately will stand alone. Um, speaking to the, uh, to the UN Assembly, uh, it was amazing to hear Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, say, Israel will stand alone if it must. And that, um, and, and you know, once again, in times past, we've said, well, it, you know, America is always going to stand with Israel. And yet it was when, when uh, the U.S. voted to sanction Israel for the settlements that they've built in these so-called disputed areas, um, this was the entire world voting against Israel. I mean, it was, it was the first time this had happened. It was in, it was incredible uh, of how this happens. And by the way, I've been to these settlements, um, and people call them settlements. They are like, it's like calling Miramar a settlement. I mean, these are like full-on neighborhoods with roads and schools and not Publix, but whatever the equivalent of Publix is um, of, over there and you know, falafel stands and all the, all the rest. Um, and, and, and the thing is, is that, I mean, these are, these are areas that are absolutely thriving um, in Israel. And the problem is that this is where, um, you know, kind of, this is, once again, this is why uh, this is a, a, they call it a, a, a cup of trembling. Because when we deal, when um, every, U, every U.S. president, every U.S. president, um, if they get elected for two terms, and this is just, this goes back, I mean, just follow this 30, 40 years. Every U.S. president, in their second term, towards the end, they start thinking legacy, and they think, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be the president that brought peace to the Middle East. And they end up getting so frustrated, and I'm telling you, this is red, blue, both sides of the aisle, doesn't matter who you talk about. Uh, they all get so incredibly frustrated because Jerusalem has been, is currently, and will be a cup of trembling. You see, and here's the thing that's interesting. When Israel became a nation in 1948, they didn't even control the city of Jerusalem. 
um, the city of Jerusalem was controlled by the country of Jordan until June of 1967. And on June 5th, 1967, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria all got together and decided to attack Israel. Amazingly, um, Israel, uh, which is what's called the Six-Day War, um, because Israel made short work of them, um, Israel defeated these three nations and took land back from them. In fact, we have a map up here, and this is what was what's called the West Bank, um, including the city of Jerusalem. Uh, this whole Sinai Peninsula uh, was taken, Gaza Strip was taken, and then the Golan Heights um, was taken uh, as well. And so, uh, which I've been on top of the Golan Heights, and uh, it is a pretty, it is such an incredibly strategic location. Um, I, I've been on top of the Golan Heights, and they still have um, these giant machine guns that you actually sit in that were pointed at Israeli school children at, that in, the, in the Galilee area as they were, um, as they were headed um, you know, to, and, to and from school, uh, which they had to build underground tunnels and all this. It's really... Um, well, anyway, um, all of these countries, because they had, um, they had attacked Israel and Israel had took all this, then now that there was... There was uh, there's no peace with these countries. And in 1979, um, President Carter uh, worked out a peace agreement. By the way, President Carter is the only one who's actually worked out something that has la lasted as far as U.S. presidents go. Um, I should have said that to him when I met him. I did meet President Carter several years ago um, at Disney World. And um, it was at the, uh, I've shown this picture like a million times, but it was at the Philhar Magic. Have you ever been to that? You've got to put on the 3D glasses. And... Um, Anyway, he, he left from there, and uh, there was, there, uh, you know, there's, uh, what's that called? It's a small world right there, and there's these restrooms. Well, he goes into the restrooms, and just because I'm weird, I was waiting outside for him. And uh, so, anyway, um, so he, I come out, and I took a picture with him, and uh, he just busted my chops about being a Red Sox fan. And um, so, as he is a Braves fan. But anyway, uh, but President Carter worked out an agreement uh, for peace with, um, with, with Egypt, and they just gave back this area that was called the Negev, uh, which is the Sinai Peninsula. And the Sinai Peninsula is literally just the desert. So like, hey, listen, you can have it. And um, so they gave it back, and now they've, they, Israel has had peace um, for quite some time with, um, with, with Egypt. But once again, um, it came at a price because that's what set the precedent of what now is called land for peace. Uh, Jordan and Israel have had peace since 1994. They worked out a deal for Jordan to get uh, water from the Jordan River uh, and the area of the Sea of Galilee um, in exchange for peace. Syria and Israel are still hostile because they want the Golan Heights back. And they're like, no, we're not giving the Golan Heights back because that's too, too, too uh, strategic of a location. Um, to give back. And if, if you are interested in this, the absolute best book that I've read, and I've read a whole bunch of books, um, uh, if you want to know, uh, if you want a book about Israel's right to the land, um, the, uh, the woman that was the, um, I was, uh, she wasn't Secretary of State, but she was like the Assistant Secretary of State. Anyway, uh, the book is called From Time Immemorial. Um, that is an excellent book on Israel's right to the land. She worked under the Carter administration. This is an absolutely fantastic work. Um, it, is, it is not an easy book to read. So this is like, I have trouble sleeping. Let's pick that book up, read chapter two. I trust you. You're going to learn a lot, and then you're going to sleep like a baby. But if you want to read a great book about, uh, throughout history, Israel, uh, Jerusalem being the cup of trembling, th this is an excellent read, very fast, um, the book that you want to read is called Epicenter uh, by uh, Joel C. Rosenberg. Um, this is a fantastic book. Uh, Joel gets called into, listen, it is uncanny. Um, he, Joel writes these fiction books for the most part, and what he does is, is that he tries to come up with these ideas about how could these things in the Bible, these prophetic things in the Bible, come to pass. And so he writes, um, Epicenter is not a fiction book. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a nonfiction book. It's a, it's a work, him working through all these Bible passages. Um, he's a Bible believer. I mean, he really is a, 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 a strong Christian uh, from a Jewish background. But anyway, he, he puts, these, um, he puts these, these novels together about like, well, how could that happen? And the crazy part is, is that, um, and if you can Google this, this is like, uh, this is so insane, is that, 
um, like, you know, how does this, the, the whole idea of, um, you know, the rise of Islam, all that, terrorism, and he hit, one of his books was um, that um, terrorists steal airplanes and crash into uh, the Denver airport. Uh, well, it, it wasn't exactly that. Uh, but and once again, this came out like six months before 9-11. Um, and so it's just, it's, and, and he, he's done this four or five times. Like, and he's like, all I'm doing is just thinking about how could it work out? Like, how could these things kind of happen? And uh, anyway, I may not have all the details right as far as that book, but um, it, uh, the book Epicenter, I highly, 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 highly recommend it. Uh, it deals with the centrality of, Jew of Jerusalem in Bible prophecy. If you want to understand Bible prophecy, we always have to understand uh, the role of Israel and the role of Jerusalem. Okay, last thing, Malachi, and then we're done. Uh, Malachi is about the restoration of God. The book is laid out in a series of questions that God asks Israel. Uh, it deals with God asking questions about, uh, questions about God's love, questions about honoring God, questions about tithing, questions about marriage and divorce. Um, it deals in chapter 3 with the John the Baptist being uh, the forerunner uh, in the spirit and power of Elijah. We'll deal with that next time uh, when we get to John the Baptist, um, who is probably my, one of my favorite uh, Bible, Bible characters. Um, but then in chapter 4, there's this interesting passage, and I want to just spend a couple minutes on this, and then we're done. Um, it says in Malachi chapter 4, But you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness, shall arise with healing in his wings. Now, every Torah-observant Jew wore a, a shawl. You know, if you've seen a, a, a prayer shawl, um, and, and the, I should have brought mine, but... Um, um, but a, a prayer shawl is called um, a uh, it's called a talit in, in Hebrew, and it was worn. You know, everyone wore these in Jesus' day. But then they would have what are called uh, the borders were called the kanaf, and then they would it would have these these five tassels at the end uh, that were called sidzi, and the uh, it's spelled just so it's a t z i t z i t. If you're from the south, you're like, what was that? T zit zit. Uh, so, uh, anyway, um, but that is, once again, in Numbers, if you want to write in Numbers chapter 15, um, that they're, they're, the people of Israel are commanded to have tassels on the end. Um, that, that has, it's in five knots representing um, the, the five books of Moses. Um, there's, you know, uh, ten, uh, the representing the Ten Commandments. Anyway, um, so you went about your day. The reason that you had the tassels is that the tassels would stick out. Like if you were, you see an observant Jew, they'll have an undershirt, they'll have whatever shirt they are wearing, but then they'll have an undershirt, usually a white undershirt, and the tassels will be sticking out. Um, and so the whole point is that uh, uh, throughout the day, you're going to be, you're going to interact with these tassels and they're going to remind you that, um, that God is with you um, as you go throughout your day. But then there's this moment in Mark chapter 5, and I put the verses in there, but I'll just tell you quickly. There's this woman who has an issue of blood for 12 years. Um, and then she says this. She says, if I can only touch the hem of Jesus' garment. She touches the hem of his garment, and she's immediately made well. And then Jesus stops everybody. They're in a crowd of people because they're on their way to somebody else's house. Um, a man by the name of Jairus, whose daughter has just died who's 12 years old, as long as this, she's been alive as long as this woman has had uh, an issue of, of blood. And then Jesus in this crowd says, who touched me? You know, it's like his Obi-Wan Kenobi, well, who's touched me? The force is strong right here. Anyway, so, uh, so anyway, he's like, who touched me? They're, they don't know. And then this woman um, appears before him. She falls down and tells him the story. And he says, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. You've been healed of your affliction. And, um, now, the thing is, what this woman is reaching for is the tzitzit. She's, re she's, she's reaching for the kanaf, the border, the hem. You see, um, uh, in, in Luke, it gives us a little extra detail. It says, now a woman with a flow of blood for 12 years had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. That is the kanaf, the... the, the and, why is that? Listen, because she believed something about Jesus. 
She believed that if this, if I believe that he is the Messiah, and in Malachi chapter four says that when the Messiah comes, that he will have healing in his, in his, the wings, the kanaf, um, and that, that part of his, of his shawl, and that, um, and she experienced that physical healing. And once again, but in Malachi 4, it doesn't just talk about physical healing. It talks about, in, in verse 5 of that chapter, about fathers being reunited with sons. And so that can, we can talk about um, relationships being, being healed. It ta- in verse 3, it talks about people uh, having victory in their lives. And we can talk about people having um, emotional healing, healing from addictions. And, and the point of this is, is, is that God wants to work. And the minor prophets are calling to the people over and over again saying, God wants to work. God wants to forgive. And that he's calling the people back to God. And, when the, and the Bible tells us that for us to take a step in God's direction, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. It's not like, well, you take the first step and then I'll show up. No, it's that God's already there waiting for us. All we have to do is decide to say, you know what, I'm coming back. And he brings the healing in his wings, the restoration in his wings. He brings the forgiveness in his wings. And that's where the Old Testament ends. Um, And then there's 400 years of silence. And we're going to talk about that next time, um, waiting for the Messiah to appear. So let's pray together. And Lord, we want to thank you so much. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the Hebrew scriptures and how they prepare the way for the Messiah to come, and we look forward to next time as we begin to look in depth at our Savior Jesus, all that he's done, all that he did, all that he wants to do, fulfilling every prophecy, every jot and every tittle of what needed to happen to prove that he was the Messiah. And God, to prove that you want to do that work that not even a sparrow can fall from the ground, fall to the ground without you knowing. That's how intimately you are aware of the details of our lives, and we thank you for that. We love you. We pray it in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.